This is Kemi. I met Kemi in Nigeria last year when she was admitted to hospital with pneumonia, a common lung infection. Kemi needed a particular simple medical therapy. Kemi needed oxygen. The same oxygen that we breathe in the air around us, the same oxygen that many of you will have inhaled if you've ever been a patient in hospital. Oxygen is an amazing medical therapy and we've been using it to save lives for over 100 years. A little bit of oxygen for a sick child like Kemi is almost miraculous. However, there are thousands of children around the world who need oxygen right now, but who won't get it. Children with pneumonia, like Kemi, others with meningitis, malaria, babies born prematurely. This simple, life-saving therapy simply doesn't reach them. So, how do we get simple, life-saving therapies like oxygen to the children who need them? Well, first, we need to stop pretending they're simple. This is a children's hospital just down the road. At first glance, providing oxygen here might look simple. Oxygen comes from the wall, nurses give it to patients. However, when we look behind the scenes, we see a different picture. Nurses will tell you how they're trained to give oxygen safely, how they follow guidelines so that every child who needs oxygen gets it. Engineers will tell you that there's a three-storey high tank sitting out the front of the hospital that contains 30,000 litres of liquid oxygen. They'll tell you there's 20 kilometres of piping taking that oxygen to every single room in the, in the hospital. They'll tell you about quality control, maintenance and backup systems that ensure we never run out of oxygen. This is a hospital in Nigeria. A couple of years ago, I asked the director here about oxygen, and he said, ah, Dr. Hamish, oxygen is my biggest headache. Oxygen supply was always running out. Doctors were having to choose which child would get oxygen, which child would miss out. And technicians had piles of broken equipment they couldn't fix. Providing oxygen to children is complex. There's technical complexity, administrative complexity, and then there's the enormous complexity of human behaviour. How do you get fallible humans like you and I to give oxygen to the right child at the right time, every time? Complexity doesn't mean we throw it in the too hard basket, but it does mean we need to understand how complex interventions actually work in messy, real-life situations. I'll give you an example. In Nigeria, part of our plan was to use oxygen concentrators. Concentrators are amazing little machines that draw in air, take out the nitrogen, and give a continuous supply of medical-grade oxygen. We know from experience that concentrators can work well for many years with minimal repair or maintenance needs. Concentrators are a great alternative to traditional oxygen cylinders, which run out after a few days and are notoriously unreliable and expensive. However, when we first proposed concentrators in Nigeria, doctors from one hospital told me that in their experience, concentrators didn't really seem to work that well. So we went around and we tested every concentrator on their wards, every concentrator they were using for patients. And we found they were absolutely right. Most of their concentrators were not even giving oxygen. They were just blowing out air. Imagine that. You think you're giving life-saving oxygen therapy to a patient, and it's just plain air. So we sat down to try and work out what was going on. And we found that their concentrators were not suitable for use in hot, humid, dusty Nigerian conditions. Many of them were poor quality, many were donated secondhand from abroad, many were dead on arrival. Concentrators were flogged until they died with no routine maintenance and no way of doing repairs or even getting spare parts. By understanding how concentrators were actually used in this particular environment, we were able to work together to improve the system. We selected simple concentrators that work well in hot, humid conditions. We installed reliable solar power. We built teams of 
nurses, technicians and doctors who could look after concentrators and access help for repairs. And we worked with nurses to make sure that oxygen therapy was integrated seamlessly into their existing bedside routines and that they weren't overloaded with more work. Simple solutions that came from understanding and wrestling with the complex. We learned similar lessons when we looked at how oxygen was being used for patients. For example, we'd heard that some nurses were turning children's oxygen off overnight when they thought no one was watching. Shocking, right? Well, it turns out that many nurses and patients were actually scared of oxygen. You see, it's generally the sickest patients that need oxygen, and sometimes these sick patients die. Not because of the oxygen, but because they're very, very sick. So these nurses had seen some children who died while they were on oxygen. So they associated oxygen with death. They weren't stopping children's oxygen to be nasty, but because they were under the misconception that oxygen was causing harm. By understanding how people perceived oxygen and how nurses actually used it, we were able to find ways to help nurses use oxygen well and confidently. Part of this involved oximeters. Oximeters are machines which enable nurses to be able to measure the blood oxygen level of a child. This means they can tell who needs oxygen, and they can immediately see the beneficial effect when they put someone on oxygen. And they can even share this with families. By making the effort to understand the complexity of how nurses were using oxygen, we were able to come up with effective, locally appropriate solutions. Now, Kemi got oxygen when she needed it, and it helped save her life. Kemi got oxygen because we worked together to understand how an oxygen system would work in the local context. And then we built on what people were already doing well. But this is not just a story about oxygen. This is about how we get basic life-saving therapies to the people who need them. Not just in the easy-to-reach places, but especially the difficult ones. Basic rehydration for children with diarrhoea. Basic resuscitation for newborn babies. Basic prevention of malaria using bed nets. Basic health interventions that we know save lives. And this involves all of us. Healthcare workers, technicians, managers, researchers, educators. So let's stop pretending that basic health therapies are simple. Every health intervention is complex to do in messy, real-world environments. And let's embrace that mess and try to understand how the complex interventions actually work on the ground. And let's start with what's working. Let's build on people's insights and strengths. That's where change starts. Thank you.